Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. All right, all right. Hey, it is so great to see you this morning, and uh, you sound great. So good to sing about the Lord. Hey, some years ago, uh, I heard Bill McCartney speak. I don't know if you know who that is. He was once the um, head coach for the uh, University of Colorado Buffaloes um, back in, I guess, the 80s, maybe early 90s. In fact, they played uh, Notre Dame a couple times in the, old, uh, the Orange Bowl. And in 1990, in fact, he led them to a national championship. Now, he became uh, kind of this controversial figure for, for lots of reasons. One, he was radically changed by the gospel, by Christ. And uh, he received Christ and his grace and forgiveness. And he really brought this into all things in his life. Bill McCartney was the one who ultimately started this thing called Promise Keepers that some of y'all might know, ministry to, to men in particular, and um, I heard him speak one time, and he was sharing a story about uh, a, a night before a big game. They were in the hotel. All the players were together, all of his you know, staff and everybody. They gathered together for this team meeting, as they do. And he was thinking, how could he get them motivated? It was a big bowl game, and uh, he wanted to consider how could he get these guys to play like they've never played before. And he had an idea based on his own life and his own experience as a believer, as a, as a Christian. And he told him this. He said, guys, here's what I want you to do. In the morning, we're going to get on the bus. We're going to head to the stadium. A lot of you have family here. Uh, maybe you've got a girlfriend who's come. Maybe your, your grandmother, parents, whomever else might be in town. Uh, here's what I want you to do. If they're here or not, I want you to contact them. I want you to talk to them. If they're here, I want you to go find them, go to the room or whatever else you need to do and talk to them. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell them that tomorrow when the game starts, when you step on that field, the moment you step on the field, that everything that you do, every move you make, every down, every play is for them. You're doing it out of your, here's what he said, your love for them. So I want you to choose somebody and I want you to tell them tonight that, that they're going to, and if they're not here watching on television, national television, Every time you're out there to isolate on you every play because every move you make is motivated by your great love for them. And he said, I'm going to be at the, the bus and every one of you guys getting on the bus, I'm going to look you in the eyes and I'm going to ask if you've done this. And you just give me the nod. Did it, coach? And you know how the story goes. They, they got, he got down there, sure enough, every guy he locked eyes with him. Did you do it? And as they got on the bus, did it, coach? Every single one of them. Every player going out there on the field to play for someone they loved. Bill McCartney says he has never seen a group of young men play with as much heart, play football like those guys did that day. It's an incredible story that's still locked in my mind because it demonstrates the power of love. The greatest motivation to do anything in life, right? And you, you take that over into our, uh, our Christian lives. You know, a lot of people, we, we serve the Lord for a lot of different reasons, frankly. Uh, some people serve the Lord out of fear. Fear is a motivator. At least for a season, it'll beat you down over time. A lot of people serve the Lord because uh, it's pragmatic. It works, and it does. But if that's it, it works until, watch this, till it doesn't. I mean, in your own mind, right? Like, I didn't see it going that way. I didn't see this coming. What happened? I've been obedient, right? Love is the great motivator. You know, throughout the summer, we've been walking through the, the Psalms, and we've actually been reading through the Psalms together, and it's been awesome. And it has been an incredible time for me personally, just to learn to worship God through every season of the soul for who he is and what he's done. Because all of life is a response, right? He is the, the initiator. I mean, you don't even have to get to the gospel before you read the first part of Genesis says, in the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth. See, all of life is a response. He's the initiator. He's the creator. We're not. And you know what's interesting? Even in our day, scientists 
are, you know, a hundred years ago, this was not the common uh, thought, but now it very much is that our, there, was a, there was a thought that the only thing that's eternal is the universe. Well, now scientists are saying, no, the universe had a beginning. I mean, this is, this is significant. No, the universe had a beginning. In fact, it's, it's kind of expanding. You call it what you want, Big Bang, whatever else. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created everything. So we exist because he created us. We respond to him. And I find it fascinating. You don't find as many atheists in the scientific realm as you do, say, the humanitarians, or, uh, I mean, the, the humanities, and people who are really studying social sciences and such, maybe. But when you get into science, people go, nope. Something started this, and you get to intricacies, of, of, intricacies of, of design and such. People know that God created us, so it plays out into our own personal lives. God created me. Why? For his purpose, right? So all of life is a response. But here's how this plays out, right? Every day becomes a week, and weeks become months, and months become years. Years become lifetimes, and all of life for the believer is a response every day to what Christ has done for us. It's why, you know, we're, we're going to talk about this month, what it means to follow Jesus every day. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, you can see it on the screen there. Jesus said to, to them all, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, the cross is not, well, take up your burden and whatever difficulty you have, just bear it and bear under it and keep going. That's not what he's talking about. The cross means one thing. It's, it's death. Die daily. See, there's a daily component to following Jesus every single day, right? Now, for many years, um, I've been reading uh, Oswald Chambers' My Utmost for His Highest. Anybody ever read this or maybe you read it some? Um, classic devotional. I started reading this back in college, um, and I've, I've read it every year since. And so, you know, there's certain days that come back, and one of them, most significant for me, at a time in my life, may have been right out of college, I read August 4th. That was this past Friday. And it's all marked up in my book that I've had for a long time. And so uh, that's a portion of my devotional. I'll read scripture or journal and, and pray. And, um, and in that, on that day, Oswald Chambers says this, and this is what I love why I read it, is he always gets me back to the main thing. But in that particular devotional that day, he says this at the end. He says the essence of the Christian life, the key, he says, to the Christian life, is not found in what uh, we know about God. It's not found in, in the end, really, what we do for God. He says the key to the Christian life is found in intimacy of relationship with God through Christ and then the character and the qualities that are produced as a result of that one relationship. We sang about it earlier. One thing remains. One thing. The one thing that the Christian life is all about is a personal daily walk with Christ. And what happens is we get uh, all you know, focused on all kinds of things. We forget the one thing. And what I want to do is remind us throughout this month to get back to the one thing that matters the most. Greg McEwen wrote a book called Essentialism. It's a great book, by the way, on really kind of how to order your life, how to prioritize your life. The subtitle is The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. Anybody might think that's a good be a good book for you. Yeah. Greg McEwen, great book. No kidding. Read about, I don't know, a couple years ago. But, but he, he writes this. He says, you cannot overestimate the unimportance of practically everything. And yet we get lost into the unimportant. Now, this is only true. That statement really is only true if you have one singular dominant focus of your life. I call it the explosive, what Thomas Chalmers, a Puritan preacher, called it the explosive power of a new affection. You see, the believer has something in their lives that trumps everything else and brings focus to our lives. Jesus said it, seek first, there's only one first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else, essentially, will find its right place. But it's only if your heart and your life is focused. Would this describe your life? Would you say, man, my life is hyper-focused on Christ and what he has done for me? If not, 
then this sermon is going to help you as it's helped me, even in preparation. So let's talk about this, Everyday Jesus. As we move towards school, uh, New Year, it's a great time to rethink what's most important. Get our lives in order, right? Get back to the back in the groove of, uh, of church and all the above. We're going to talk about family. Next week, we're going to talk about work. And students, we're going to talk about school. That's your work. What is it to glorify God? What does it mean to follow Jesus every day at school? What does it mean to follow Jesus every day? In your work. Essentially, we're asking the question, what does it look like to be a Christian? What does it mean to walk with Jesus every day? And our guiding verse is out of Colossians 3.17. You can see it there. Let's all read this together. Here it is. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Is he serious? Everything? Every word that you say? Every word of every sentence? Every response to your spouse or friend or roommate or parent? Every word? Everything I do is done for Jesus? Really? How does that happen? So what we're going to do is talk about this. And here's really my main point today. It's this. Captured by his love, we follow Jesus every day in everything we say and everything we do. Imagine a world like that. Imagine your, if you're married and have family, imagine a family, imagine a home like that. Where the father only says what Jesus would say. I mean, that's essentially what he's saying here. Everything in the name of the Lord. That means in the, according to his character. Like he, you could say it this way, as he would. What would it look like for Jesus to be in my house? What if Jesus had my role? What if Jesus was, was the pastor of this church? That'd be awesome. What if Jesus took on your role? What if Jesus was in your seat tomorrow morning? What if Jesus held your position and your, what would that look like? That's what we're going to talk about. That would be, frankly, that would be the kingdom of God. Now, Paul, when we look in the New Testament, Paul calls it keeping in step with the spirit or he calls it, you know, walking in the spirit. He says, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. His word is truth, who he is. He would say, be filled with the spirit. He'd say, pray without ceasing. You ever thought about that one? Like, really? How does that? I don't know how that happens. What does that look like? So we're going to unpack it. Here's what we're going to do. I don't want you to miss a week. Throughout August, we're going to say, hey, we're talking about everyday Jesus, following Jesus every day. Today, we're going to look at the home. Next week, we're going to look at the the workplace. And then on the 20th in my church, what does that look like? That's launch Sunday, by the way. And then on the 27th, what does it look like to live just in community uh, as we follow Jesus every day? Go and turn to Colossians 3. And uh, I want us to look at this uh, passage together, really a a passage in the the third chapter that we're going to look at throughout... um, throughout this month. Now, as you're turning there, I want to place this into context and we'll, we'll jump in. Uh, uh, Justin alluded to it earlier, but when you get into the book of Colossians, here's what Paul does. And this is important to pause for a moment. Think about this. Uh, I think we often go, oh yeah, Jesus uh, rescues us from our sin. Bam. Okay. Now what do we do? And wait, 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 no, 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 no. Let's go. Let's go back to that for a minute. Uh, because what he does throughout the book of Colossians in chapters one and two, he says, Let me remind you of who you are. Let me remind you of what Christ has done. Before we ever get to the imperatives, okay, the commands, the the how-tos or the what-to-dos, let's let's talk about who we are because that changes everything. And and so what what some writers have noted, commentators have said, he he spends the first couple of chapters talking about what we could say are gospel indicatives. We've talked about this before. Indicatives are just statements of truth. They're facts. So he says... Now, here are the facts about you. If you have received Christ, if you're a Christian, here's what's true about you. He spends a couple of chapters just doing that, the gospel indicatives, before he gets to the gospel imperatives, okay, gospel-driven commands. He says things like, here's the truth about you. If you're now in Christ, in chapter 1, verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. 
In chapter 121, he says, You were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, but now, he says this over and over again, but now you are reconciled. He's saying, you now, living the Christian life, is not so much seeking God's approval, but in fact, you already have it. Now live in response to his great love. And then look at what it says in Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, that's another guiding word for Paul. Because all of this is true. As you receive Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. There again, he says, and give thanks. Be thankful for what? For what he has done for us. Again, all of life, a response. And then in Colossians 3, verse 1, he says this. You can see it there in your Bible. It says, if then. And really he's saying because. He's he's speaking to believers. If then, because you have been raised with Christ. And then he goes on. For you have died and your life is hidden With Christ in God. And then verse 4 of chapter 3 says, Christ, who is your life? I mean, he goes goes that far. No, he is life. He's the focus of all things. Verse 5, put to death then, or put off. Verse 12, put on. So he goes through this list. When I was in uh, middle school, I was probably about sixth grade, I had a a teacher, his name was Bill Cordell, in my church and even my Sunday school group of, imagine that, little sixth grade guys sitting around and Coach Cordell uh, who I thought was older than dirt at the time. He's probably, he's probably my age. And he was teaching. And um, I still remember to this day that passage and him teaching that passage to a group of guys who he probably thought were not listening to him at all. But he says, guys, listen, here's what you do. You put off these things. And we went through a list. In fact, he told us to write it down. So I opened my Bible. I still have this little Bible. Coolest Bible ever. It's got, it's got like a denim cover on it. It is legit. Uh, It's it's come back around now. It's a good news translation. And I wrote in it, I wrote um, Colossians 3. Put off, and then I have this list. It's it's there. And put on. I have this list. And Bill Cordell uh, would have never known the impact he has on my life. Now, I wasn't planning on going here, but parenthetically, gang, we're about to start a new uh, Connect Group year. New opportunity for you to be a Bill Cordell in someone's life. You've had those people in your life. Now God's raising you up to be that person, to serve, whether it be holding preschool babies or teaching sixth grade boys or girls or teaching adults, every single one of us, to step up. I'm praying this fall for a volunteer revolution in our church. Here's here's the challenge for every member of our church. What's your ministry? And who are you discipling? Who are you pouring your life into? Bill Cordell was one of those guys. And it was this this passage. So think about it. Now that your life is centered on Christ, this is what he's saying. If you have received Christ, you've been forgiven. You're not having now to work to gain his favor. And so you're not trying to gain other people's favor. You're you're able to say, you know what? My, My value is defined by what Christ has done for me. Not by the opinions of others or the approval of others. Not because I've performed so well. I'm free now to serve others freely. Like without cost. Without, you know, kind of this law of reciprocity. I can reach out to others and serve them by grace, not anticipating if I do that, then maybe they'll, you know, they'll help me out. I can now love freely I can actually offer words of encouragement and love whether I get them or not because all the love I need I have found in Christ. Now, why do I go that far to say all this? What does that have to do with living in a family? Everything, right? What does that have to do with being married? Seeking to serve another person instead of yourself. What does that have to do with relationships at work? What does that have to do with the way we we encounter people in our community? Everything. The gospel drives everything that we do. 
as believers. And it's why our worship leader, Justin, has done it today. You know, we're always focused on what Christ has done for us because out of that comes our lives. And I'd love to think, here in our church at least, if you're a guest, I'd love to think that with all of our PCBC uh, peeps and fam, I'm preaching to the choir, as it were, because you're like, yes. So Jeff, let's get on with it. I want to live this kind of life. So look at Colossians 3, verses, so we're going to look at 18 through 21 today, or really a smaller portion of scripture. And uh, listen, I don't want my, I know my single adult friends, that's a lot of us here, don't check out on me. I know you're going, oh yeah, he's going to talk about the family again, here we go. And I hear that sometime from singles, that man, we're such a family-centric church that uh, sometimes we can feel that we get left out. Listen, we need the gospel to to know how to live as single adults. We need the gospel to know how to live as married people. We need the gospel to to know how to live as children in the home. So look at this. We're going to look at, in my Bible, I have the ESV, there's a little sub, you know, kind of a chapter title, and it says, or section title, rules for Christian households is what it says. Rules for Christian, rules. 2017, really? Rules for Christian households? I, yeah, I think so. God says, you know, there, there are roles, is how, what I'm going to call them. Uh, there are positions. There are, there are certain things that a family does, and each person has a different role. Not one more important than the other. Everybody together, parts of the whole, like a drama, like a team. We all play a different part. Verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands. All right. Hey, let's close that out and let's pray. Look, we're going we're to head out right now. We're going to apply, apply that one. Um, yeah, I mean, immediately, you know, in our culture, really, because our temperaments don't match up with what God is, is teaching us here. Wait till we get to the husbands, right? Some of you know this passage well. My wife submit. And by the way, that word, it means to um, subject oneself to. It means to, I mean, you could argue it means obey. It means to put yourself under another. It means to submit. Submit. And in fact, in a parallel passage in Ephesians 5, um, where Paul writes about this and goes into greater detail, it's where he talks about marriage as being, uh, it's, it's gospel reenactment. We've talked about this. It's, it's how Christ loves his church. Christ, the groom, and the church, his bride, in the analogy, he says, this is a mystery Because marriage points to something else. And in that passage, he says, submit to Christ. Same word, hupotasso in the Greek. Submit to Christ. Submit to one another, is what he says. And then he says, wives, submit to your husbands. And so just as, and then he goes on, he says, just as Christ is head of the church, so is the husband head of the wife or the family. And this is controversial stuff, by the way, in our culture. But look at what he says. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. And fitting, that really is because it it works. It makes sense. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke or exacerbate or frustrate your children lest they become discouraged. Don't discourage them. Okay, let's break this down. I tried to get all creative in my studies this week and then I realized, no, I think it's pretty clear. Let's talk about the roles, each one, and then we'll wrap up our time together. The first, the role of wives is, what does it say? Submit. Yeah. I mean, that's it, to arrange under, to subordinate, to subject oneself to. It means to yield to one's uh, admonition or advice. This, again, is gospel reenactment in the home. The question is not so much, will the woman submit, though there's that, or even will the husband submit, but to whom will she submit? And it's implied here, that the woman is to submit to a man whose heart has been reshaped by the gospel. And listen, single friends, single women, 
Uh, I mean, you could date him, I suppose, but as you discover that a man's male ego has not been transformed by the gospel, say, bye, Felicia, or whatever you want to say to him. <laughs> say, we're done. I'm out. Because I will not submit to a man who is not yet submitted to the Lord Jesus. Don't let it happen. This is what I think Paul's saying. See, does the husband tell his wife what to do? What, what does this look like? Again, back to being very pragmatic throughout this series. He doesn't tell us what it looks like. Uh, you know, what are the details? Does the husband guide all the finances in the home? Does he, does he make the final decision? Does the wife have any say in decisions? Well, of course she does. And there are times when a husband submits to his wife. I mean, if you both are exactly alike, have the same opinion, same gifts, somebody's not necessary, right? <laughs> um, and so what happens, I know in our family, you know, uh, Stacy has certain gifts, and, and, and you all know me well enough. She's, you know, she's the detail queen in our family, right? I mean, she's managing all kinds of details in our lives and, and the home and family. and That's her great gifts, and so we complement one another. We talk together when we make decisions. I'll bow to her, uh, her expertise, you know, in certain things. You know, I'll say, okay, we're going to get a puppy. Damn. <laughs> um, and we did. And, uh, and she's awesome. So I feel like I need, I need pics. I'm all excited. I need to show you pics of Gypsy, our new puppy. Um, she's a golden doodle. She's an adventurous, free-spirited wanderer. She's a gypsy, and she's a lot of fun. But uh, we, we work together, right? Uh, and, and, when we, and if you're smart, men, listen. If you're wise, you do this. What we do know is two people given over to marriage, seeking to live for Christ, will seek to serve the other. If you come into marriage saying, well, this is how my family did it, and this is what we do. Young, I know I did this in my marriage early on. Uh, my dad did that in our family. My mom did that. You know, and, or... My dad, she stays, my dad took out the trash all the time. My dad didn't do that. <laughs> Mom did that. I mean, you know you, how that works? But here's the deal. Don't let your family, don't, don't place your family, your experience up there with Scripture. Right? No, no, those are details and such. But the standard is the Bible, not your experience. Not your family. Not your family of origin. The Bible is... See, your family, your experience is negotiable. The Bible's not. So the role of wives, submit. The role of husbands, love, right? Husbands, uh, this word means house dweller, literally, or house steward, even better. Men, you're a steward. You have one role, stewardship of your family before God. You don't own your wife. You don't own your kids. We talked about it Father's Day. If you want to go deeper here, we talked about the man's role of provision and protection. That's your role as a leader. There's nothing more fulfilling than two people giving themselves over to the needs of another, you know, to, to give our lives. That is biblical marriage. See, the, the, the ethic of personal fulfillment, romanticism, which drives marriage in our culture, in our day, will always lead to frustration. Marriage is not first romantic. It's not a bargain of personal fulfillment. It's, in, it's instead to do in someone's life, listen, what Jesus Christ has done in your life. This is what it means to follow Jesus every day in your marriage. But here's the countercultural thing about marriage. Single adults, listen. And married adults, listen. Students, listen. Here's the countercultural thing um, about Christian marriage. It's not the greatest thing. It's not the greatest thing. Now, you listen to music, go to movies, you listen to the romanticists of our day in the Western culture. And love between a man and a woman or love between someone and somebody is, is the ultimate thing. And in fact, then the greatest expression of that is, is a sexual thing. And it is the greatest. Here's the, cult, here's the countercultural thing about Christianity. Not the greatest thing. You see, when you look at Ephesians 5, Paul says that marriage is not the ultimate thing. It's penultimate. It's not the last thing. Not even close. It's, it, it's at best the second to the last thing, meaning it's, it's, a, it's a type, it's a picture, it points to something else. 
It's gospel reenactment in the home. That's what marriage is. Marriage shows us that the gospel is the highest thing. Jesus is the highest thing. Singleness points to Christ. Marriage points to Christ. And for some of us, even our best marriages are not the greatest thing. And for those of us who've kind of idolized marriage, no, no, no. Because listen, single adults um, in our culture, to be single is to bring glory to Christ in amazing ways in a crazy culture like us, like ours. You're an adult. You're not married? No, I'm not. Hmm. And I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wait, let's talk about that. That's powerful in our culture. I just want to encourage all of our single adults that we, we need the gospel to know how to be single. We need the gospel to know how to, to be married, to be widows and widowers and, and men and women. If, if marriage is ultimate, that is devastating. See, no human relationship can bear the burden of, God, of Godhood. And if you put that on a spouse, and we talked about it before, you put it on your kids, you will crush them. I read a fascinating article. It was an op-ed uh, article in the New York Times by Alan DeBotton, and he's, he is entitled, Why You Marry the Wrong Person. He's not a believer. He's an atheist, as best I can tell, uh, in some other books that he's written. But he, he says, you know, an early day, and he basically says you don't know them. That's why you marry the wrong person, which is true, I think, in a lot of ways. Uh, but he says an early date question ought to be this, early on. In what ways are you crazy? <laughs> just early, just get that out there. Because everybody's normal till you get to know them. And anybody that's married knows this. The Christian answer to this, you see, is that no two people are compatible. We're all, you never find the right person because none of us are right. None of us are righteous. None of us are, are perfect, right? And so Duke University ethics professor Stanley Hauerwas has famously made this point. Listen to this. Destructive to marriage is the self-fulfillment ethic that assumes marriage and the family are primarily institution of personal fulfillment necessary for us to become whole and happy. The assumption is that there is someone just right for us to marry and that if we look closely enough, we will find the right person. This moral assumption overlooks a crucial aspect to marriage. It fails to appreciate the fact that we always marry the wrong person. Now, there's a bit of exaggeration here, but not quite. We never know whom we marry. That's what he means. We just think we do. Or even if we first marry the right person, just give it a while and he or she will change. For marriage, being the enormous thing that it is, means we are not the same person after we have entered into it. The primary challenge of marriage is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. Now, again, a bit of exaggeration, but I think he's making the point. And uh, what DeBotton does in the end of his article, he writes this, compatibility is an achievement of love. It must not be its precondition. Now, that's, that's gospel right there. Last week, we had flowers in the sanctuary. Y'all know that we may do that, or you know that. Every, you may know that we do that. Every week, we have flowers dedicated to someone or in honor of someone. Last week, it was in honor of an anniversary of Omar and Dorothy Harvey, whom some of y'all know. I've had lunch with Omar a few times and been to his home, love them so much. In honor of their 77th wedding anniversary. And he, I mean, the way they talk about one another, the way they love each other, is amazing. And uh, that's gospel reenactment. That, that's dedication. That's saying, I'm in, you're crazy, uh, and I'm in. And Omar's a little crazy. I don't mind telling you. I mean, he, if you know him, no, he's awesome. But I, and I love Omar, but uh, they love each other so well. Okay, and then to close, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, the role of the wife, okay, is to submit. The role of the husband is to love. Like Christ loved the church. That's where you argue the husband has the heart. It's all love. You know that. It's all about loving as Christ loved us. And then finally, children, here it is. Young people, your role, what is it? You tell me. Obey. 
Obey. Husbands, love, lead, serve your wife. What woman wouldn't want to submit to a man who is just like Jesus? And then, children, obey that. Obey that. You follow your parents as they follow Jesus every day. Now, here at Park Cities Baptist Church, we're, we're helping parents rethink the family as the primary discipleship group in your life. And so we have a thing called Flight Plan 252. It's our family ministry plan that helps us walk our children. We're going to have a, a parental dedication in the next hour from, from, from babies all the way until we're launching our students into college. And David Huey and the family ministry team have worked tirelessly on this. And I want to offer this. Here's the application here is why I'm going to just wrap up. Uh, we have a gift for you today. I say a gift. It's not $10 and not $15, however much this costs. Normally it's five bucks for you today. Because what we want to do is provide for you in the coming year um, a, a 52 creative family time experiences. In the uh, bulletin today, you'll see that we have one for you uh, that we want you to use based on this sermon today. And it's here. And parents, we want you to take this with you. Have information about Flight Pen 252 on the back. But we have this book uh, for you for only five bucks down in the commons. Where, um, we're providing this and helping you get this resource for you to take. Here's we start a new school year. We'd love for you uh, to grab this book on your way out. Fun ways to bring faith into the home. And this is what we want to do is help you all the time. That's what our ministries are all about. To help you be the primary caregiver uh, or disciple maker in your home. All right. So as we wrap up our time. And what we think about as we think about following Jesus every day. And by the way, Wednesday nights around here start on August 30th for families. We've got great events for kids and families across the board with marriage corps and children's choirs and Awana. But listen to this. Colossians 5, 14 and 15 says this. For the love of Christ controls us, compels us, motivates us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So here it is, captured by his love. We follow Jesus every day in everything we say and everything we do. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I want you to think about uh, your own life. And I want you to make a commitment along with me. I want you to think about stepping out on that field of life. Coach Jesus has challenged us and really to live for him and the great love that he has expressed to us means that we're going to say, watch me, isolate on me every move I make, everything I say, everything I do, everything will be in response to your great love for me. Lord, we give you our lives. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.